This morning we're continuing our journey through the Psalms, our multi-year journey through the Psalms. It's our series, Summer Under the Psalms. And we have made our way to Psalm 57 today. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see the placement of the Psalms through Scripture because it, you will see uh, either a theme or perhaps there is a, a section of Scripture that many of the Psalms deal with. And much of what we're looking at is found in 1 Samuel. The accounts of David running from Saul, that's where we are today, looking at the time when David went into the cave to escape Saul, who was chasing after him. So I want to invite you to turn with me both to Psalm 57, but also to 1 Samuel 24. And we're going to actually start in 1 Samuel to give some background as to what we're even talking about when we get to Psalm 57. So 1 Samuel 24, uh, if you remember, if you've been with us over the last several weeks, we have looked at uh, the journey that David took as he's running from Saul and what Saul's doing and, and the different Psalms that have dealt with that. Well, now we are in a situation where uh, David has uh, escaped the Ziphites. They have betrayed him and uh, that has been alleviated because Saul was turned at the end to go fight the Philistines and now he's done with the Philistines and he's turning his attention back to David. And so in verses 1 through 3, we start the contextual part of this uh, by reading together verse 1, when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness near En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's fit young men and he went to look for David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. When Saul came to the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there and he went in to relieve himself. As it reads the same in Hebrew as well. He, uh, David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Now it's a little bit of an awkward passage uh, based on what Saul is doing. And it could be that there is multiple reasons now why David wishes he had never gone into that particular cave. But Saul has come in. He had to go. When you got to go, you got to go. So David and his men, apparently it's a very large cave, we would hope. David is back in the back. Saul comes in, does his business. And this is where this story picks up. And the emphasis here and the thing that we have to think about is Saul, who is pursuing David, is now in the very same cave where David is. How much worse could this be? When he's there, the pursuer is there. When they see him walking in, not exactly sure what's going to happen here. And so we don't know. It's, I think it's unlikely that David said, hey, just a second, I got an idea for a song. And he goes back and he starts writing this down. But what most likely is, is David is recounting what's going on as he wrote. And so there's sort of a present tense, I believe, with this psalm. And also looking back on it that we see through this. The structure is, is there are four verses and then there's a refrain. And then there are more verses. And then verse 11, there's another frame, refrain. That's what we'll look at when we get to Psalm 3. Uh, psalm 57, uh, down in that part. But I want us to think then... The way David starts this psalm in Psalm 57 where he says, Be gracious to me, be gracious. Lost my place. Hang on. There we go. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. So he starts off with this, this uh, repetition here where he says, be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. When you see repetition in scripture, it's for emphasis. And so he's saying, God, be gracious to me now. Let me experience your mercy now. I need you now. I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of situation where it was just like, I, I need you now, Lord, because it has just gotten really bad. It has gotten tough, and I need you to deliver me because if you don't, I am undone. And so he says, be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until the danger passes. So the, the way we have to look at that is he says, for I take refuge in you. And that's the basis for David's plea. So in other words, he's saying, look, because of or since I take refuge in you, then be gracious, Lord. And if David is placing his hope elsewhere or anywhere else, then there's no basis, there's no legitimate right or reason for him to expect God's help. I want us to hear that. 
If David is placing his hope anywhere else, then for him to call out to God for help, there, there's no real legitimate reason for that because his faith, his hope is not fully in God. Because we know unbelievers will sometimes do that too. You've got the proverbial skydiver, right, who comes out, he doesn't believe in God and he, the parachute won't open. And so, God, if you're up there, please save me. And yet there's no basis for that. That is not a prayer of faith. There is no hope there. And yet the one who knows and loves God can boldly come before the throne of grace so that he may receive mercy and find grace to help in need. We have that when our hope is in God, when our hope is in Jesus Christ. I seek refuge in you in the shadow of your wings. Notice where he is and what he says. He's in a cave, but he says, I seek refuge in you in the shadow of your wings. So he sees God, not the cave, as being his safe refuge. God is his confidence. Psalm 20, verse 7, the psalmist writes, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So I would ask you, where is your confidence? Where is your hope placed? Is your safety dependent on your home security system or the firearm next to your bed? Is your future dependent on your 401k or your possessions? Is your health dependent on your, uh, your clean, healthy diet or your gym membership? Where is your hope? And I'm not knocking any of these. David was in a cave, right? David didn't just stand out in the open. He went in a cave to hide. So I'm, I'm not knocking these things that we do. But he wasn't depending on the cave. And that's a, a huge difference. We can be smart. We can do things that make us healthy, that make us safe as much as possible. But where is our confidence? Where is our ultimate hope? Are we depending on the things around us? And if our, and if our hope is in those things, then how can we legitimately come and say, Lord, my hope is in you. My confidence is you and you alone. I can say, you know what? I'm going to take these, these measures, these precautions, Lord, but it ain't the cave. It's you. I hide under the safety and security of your wings. David knew his future was only in God, who would not abandon him and who would not let him face death until his purpose with him on this earth was complete. And we see this confidence in verse 2 where he says, I call to the Most High who fulfills his purpose in me. I call to the God who is Most High to, who fulfills his purpose in me. David's confidence goes well beyond the current troubles, assuming that God will not let the circumstances he's in circumvent the eternal purpose of God. And ultimately, we know that God's purpose for David was to be uh, the lineage through which Christ would come. And I know that your future, like mine, is not quite so elaborate as having the Son of God come through it. And yet, this speaks to the point that I've been driving at for the last couple of weeks. And that is this there is no need to fear your future because you are invincible until God is finished with you on this earth. And even at that time, you are ushered right into the very presence of your Savior. What, a, what an amazing boost of confidence to know that I am going to complete what God has for me here on this earth. And in, then when I am done, to be ushered into his presence to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because we walked in obedience, because we placed our faith in Jesus. Do you have that level of confidence you have that level of confidence in God and what he has called you to. If not, I want to encourage you to stop and take the time to think about that and to pray about that, to take it before the Father and say, Lord, that's not where I am, but that's where I want to be. That's where I know I need to be. That's where I want to be as a follower of Jesus so that I am so confident that there is nothing going to stop me. That I will be unstoppable because the Spirit of God resides in me, overwhelms me with his power and presence and peace. And then I can do anything that I am called to do with confidence, knowing that you're going to carry that out. Yes, God's purpose may be or may include your physical death. There is no guarantee that just because you come up with, uh, in the face of danger, that God is going to avert you from that and save you and deliver you from that. The promise is not that you have tomorrow. The promise is until he's done with you here and he gets glory through you, both in living and in death, that you will go before his presence. 
So there is confidence that we have beyond this life and beyond our circumstances. Verse 3. He reaches down from heaven and he saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. God sends his faithful love and truth. So he reaches down from heaven and he saves me. This is where the sovereign dwells. The sovereign Lord over all the circumstances, over all the things that we deal with, he reaches down and he saves me. And ultimately, the salvation is going to come through David's seed in Jesus, who is later going to overcome all evil, challenging the one who tramples me by defeating death in the grave, providing full deliverance for all who trust him as Lord and Savior. Jesus is ultimately the person through whom God sent his faithful love and truth. And that would call for us to respond If that is the means through which God's faithful love and truth have come ultimately, and that is the mode of our salvation, then my encouragement is to you is to stop trusting in those other things and coming to Jesus and trusting in him alone. But in this immediate context, God would arrange the circumstances that would allow David to be or become the pursuer, turning the circumstances completely around. Saul was chasing after David. Now David finds himself in a situation in this cave where the tide has turned. And some of that is because the circumstances really do leave uh, Saul vulnerable. But just the, the sense that David knows Saul is there, but Saul doesn't know that David and his men are there. And Saul has come in alone. And so now is where we hear what the men said to David, 1 Samuel 24, verses 3 and 4. When Saul came, this context again, verse 3, when Saul came to the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there. He went in to relieve himself. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Verse 4, so they said to him, look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you so that you can do to him whatever you desire. And so David then got up and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now, when you think about that, based on what what he just heard, you might expect David to go up and secretly cut off the head of Saul. And instead, he cuts off the corner of his robe. So David could have ended it right there had he listened to his men, but he was committed to God's purpose rather than his men or even his own. He relies on God's mercy and truth. He relies on what he knows about God. He will demonstrate his commitment to the Lord's anointing. If God anointed Saul, then it was God's prerogative on how he removes him, on how he destroys him, not his. And on the reality, he depends that God is a God of mercy and compassion. And David is called later a man after God's own heart. David knows that God is faithful to deal with the situation on his own terms. And in his own way, our great temptation is to take matters into our own hands, for us to take God's work into our hands. And I would ask you, are you willing to wait for him? Are you willing to wait, just to stop and wait, to wait for what God wants to do, for him to act from heaven, as David said. Dwight L. Moody said that there's one man who won't be into heaven, and that's the self-made man. The one who does it himself. He says, no one will boast that he did it himself. But it's a humbling act to wait on the Lord. It's difficult. We have to learn to wait on God's timing for when he is ready to act. Not when we see the circumstance and say, this is the time. This is where you have your shot. Don't miss it. Don't blow it. But is there the peace that God is behind it in that moment? This is a lesson that I learned through devotional this week. In Deuteronomy 27, this became the basis for our our family devotional that Wednesday night. Uh, In verse 9 of of Deuteronomy 27, it's one little bitty phrase. It says, be silent, Israel, and listen. Now, that was in the context. If you had to read the context, the context was that Moses was giving uh, all of the instructions to the Israelites. He was telling them the commands, and he was warning them of the curses. And in that moment, he said, be silent, Israel, and listen. It was very, very important. It's a little bitty phrase, but it's one we don't always follow. And it's one that had that phrase not been there, and if it were not followed, they would miss everything, and they would totally go off the rails. And so there was much to lose by listening. And as I thought through that, there were two truths that came to my mind. One is that you can't do what you don't hear. 
And the other is you won't do what you don't listen to. When you think about that, you can't do what you don't hear. If you're so busy and there's so much noise around you and there's so much and you never stop, you never slow down, you cannot do what you don't hear because of all the noise, all the confusion around you, all of the busyness. You don't sit in, uh, sit down long enough to hear. You're not going to do or you can't do what you don't hear and you won't do what you don't listen to. So, for instance... If I'm standing up here preaching to you and I'm giving you instruction from the Word of God and you're sitting there, it's not that the the noise is, but you're not really listening. You won't do it. You won't follow what the Word of God tells you to do. So you have to both listen, you have to stop long enough to, to be able to hear, and then you need to listen and not just hear the noise going in, not just hear the voice going into your head, but to go, okay, what do I, am, am I really hearing what is being said? Am I hearing the message? Am I hearing the word as I read it daily? So you have to do both. You must be silent and listen. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I'm God. Shut out the noises. Be quiet. Be still. Get before the Lord. Because sometimes we get so busy, we feel like I got I to gotta do everything else. But if you're wise, you will understand you need to hear from God before you hear from the world. You need to hear from God before you hear from your men saying, hey, this is your moment. Take it. We have to be still before the Lord so that we can hear him. Stand on the promise that God will send his faithful love and truth at the right time and in the right way. Because David knew God and he determined to wait, then he refused to circumvent God's purpose for both Saul and himself. We saw God's purposes fulfilled in David in that moment because David decided to wait. Imagine, put yourself in that cave. Imagine what it took for David to wait on the Lord while Saul was right there in front of him, defenseless, in a, in a very uh, compromised situation and considering the extreme danger that was described here that we'll see in verses four through six. It was extremely dangerous, what we've seen before. David is out there and and he has both Philistines and Saul who are out to get him. And yet in that moment, he decided to refrain from acting. And he did it with quiet confidence in God's deliverance. Verse four, we get something here. He says, I am surrounded by lions. I lie down among the devouring lions, people whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp sword. David is describing what it looks like. He's describing the fact that this is a very serious situation. When you're surrounded by lions, I don't think you're safe. Unless there's some really thick bars or glass in between you. And David is describing something that is not safe. I'm surrounded by lions, by devouring lions. They're not the the toothless wonders who are trained for the circus. They are devouring lions. They're the ones who eat flesh. And they enjoy tearing apart their victims. He says they're people, of course it was an uh, an analogy, people whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. So the picture here is one that is deadly. David knows that this is serious. And yet in spite of the the danger, the text says something interesting, I think. He says, I lie down among devouring lions. I don't want you to miss that because I think there's something there. It's reminiscent of Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, something about sheep. Sheep will not lie down if there is a sense of danger. If you've got uh, got a a herd of sheep and there's some sense that they're going to be up and they're going to be on alert, they're not going to be lying down. And yet here, and this is the same writer of Psalm 23, says, he makes me lie down. I lie down among devouring lions. So it doesn't happen unless there's a sense of peace. And I think the picture we're getting here in Psalm 57 is that God is giving David a sense of peace even in the midst of all of this. A quiet confidence in God. This is to me reminiscent of Daniel when Daniel's in the lion's den and he is kept there overnight. He doesn't have to worry or fret or even try to fight his way out, which of course would be hopeless. 
God, he believed, would deliver him, and God did deliver him. And then we get this refrain, the first of the two refrains in verse 5. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. When you get that sense of confidence, then you've got this, this exclamation of God who should be and is exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. This seems to be a declaration of praise for the content of verses 1 through 4. As God gives him that confidence through his lament and the cry for deliverance, while 11 then will we'll deal with thanksgiving. And so we've got this first section ends with this, this uh, refrain in the song, and then he will move into 6, where he says, They prepared a net for my ste- steps. I was despondent. They dug a pit ahead of me, but they fell into it. So we have a more detailed explanation for why he is praising why he sees fit to praise God for what he has done. The enemy set a trap, but they fell into it, and it's God's doing. So exalt him. This is you who have done this. They prepared this net. I was despondent. Yeah, I was down. I was was struggling with this. But they fell into it. You delivered me, O God. Now I want you to notice back in the account of Saul and David in 1 Samuel, uh, how this event ended. And so we're going to read a lengthy portion here, verses 8 through 22, so we can get the rest of the story on what's happening. So uh, verse 8, after that, David got up. He went out of the cave. Now again, he has just cut off the edge of Saul's garment there. He got up, he went out of the cave, and he called to Saul. This is pretty bold, I think. He calls out to Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David knelt low with his face to the ground And he paid homage. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of people who say, look, David intends you to harm? So he's appealing to Saul. Why do you do this? Rather than bringing out the sword and killing Saul, he appeals to him with his words. Why do you listen to the words of people who say, look, David intends to you harm? You can see with your own eyes that the Lord handed me over to you today in the cave. I was right there. You could have brought your men in and had me killed on the spot. Someone advised me to kill you. But I took pity on you and I said, I won't lift uh, my hand against my Lord since he is the Lord's anointed. And listen to this. Listen to what David says here. Listen to the humility of David. Look, my father, look at the corner of your robe in my hand for I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. Recognize that I've committed no crime or rebellion. I haven't sinned against you, even though you're hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord take vengeance on you for me. But my hand will never be against you. As the old proverb says, wickedness come from wicked people. My hand will never be against you. So he shows his hand, if you will. Like, I'm not going to come after you. I'm not going to be a threat to you. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm not going to be a threat to you. So that kind of gives Saul an invitation to say, okay, he's not going to be a threat to me. I'm going to take him out. But he keeps going. Who has the king, verse 14, who has the king of Israel come after? What are you chasing after? A dead dog? A single flea? I'm nobody. I'm nothing. May the Lord be judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. He appeals to God right before Saul's face. Verse 16, when David finished saying these things to him, Saul replied, is that your voice, David, my son? Then Saul wept aloud and he said to David, you are more righteous than I. For you have done what is good to me, though I have done what is evil. You yourself have told me today what good you did for me when the Lord handed me over to you. You didn't kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go unharmed? So right there, he's, look, when an enemy doesn't let his, so you're not my enemy. So he's starting to put these pieces together. May the Lord repay you with good for what you've done for me today. Now, 20, he says this. Now, I know for certain you will be king and the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. Therefore, swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from, your fa- from my father's family. So David swore to Saul. Then Saul went back home and David and his men went up to the stronghold. 
man, how amazing it is that the, the, the circumstances changed so quickly. Saul was hunting David, but because David chose to wait on the Lord, the situation rectified peacefully. Saul, with Saul, realizing defeat and that he could not hold on to this and setting a trap to prevent David from becoming king, Saul himself fell into it. And it made me realize something as I was looking at this in the way that David often talks about his enemies and the way that God often handles his enemies. And, and God is, is a righteous judge who, who often brings, and you read throughout the, the Old Testament especially, he brings harsh judgment and harsh penalties down on those who are evil uh, and who fight against him. But the, the thing that I realized was that God's destruction of enemies doesn't always look the way we expect. God's destruction of enemies doesn't always look the way we expect. David, David will often pray in what we call imprecatory psalms where, God, kill them, rip their tongues out. I mean, he's just really ferocious. Lord, kill them now, kill them all. I mean, that, that sort of language that you get here. And yet, uh, in spite of the fact that David wants them annihilated, God's intent is often something different. And that is why we trust God for the results. What would have happened if David had taken matters in his own hand and kill, killed Saul that day? You wouldn't have seen God work through this. Yes, revenge would have been taken. Yes, the threat would have been removed. But at the same time, God brought things to an end the way he wanted it to. I had to learn this early as a pastor when you deal with people who are, are threats to the church. I mean, legitimate threats to the church where they come in and they want to do things that, that are harmful to the church, to the people, to the ministry, all sorts of things. And there are times that I'm praying those imprecatory prayers, you know, God, wipe them out, you know, sort of thing. And yet he deals with things differently. Sometimes it has involved me having to, to confronting and having to be hard and harsh and, and, and challenging because the threat is very real and, and difficult. Other times, it's me sitting back and doing absolutely nothing and just praying, Lord, would you change their heart or change their location? It's been my prayer for a long time. Or change their heart or change their location. But I'm not going to do anything because this is your place. And unless you lead me to confront, I'm not going to do anything. And I've been able to see over the years how God has, has honored that. And dealt with things in ways that I would not have in my own spirit. I was like, get them out. But God's like, no, I've got a, I've got a different plan. I'm going to change their heart and see how, how I move in someone's life. And you get to testify to it. You get to observe it and witness it. So it's an amazing thing when we sit back and we just trust God. And that's what David did. So he could say then in verse 7, my heart is confident, God. My heart is confident. I will sing praises. So again, we get a rep repetition. So verse 1, he uses repetition to state the request. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. And then here in verse 7, he uses repetition to give the answer. <laughs> My heart is confident. So God was gracious to provide confidence to David. So he can, he can yell, my heart is steadfast. I am rock solid because of your mercy. And then David responds by declaring that he will sing praises. Have you experienced the merciful deliverance of God? Have you been through times where you have seen him move? We talked about it earlier through our, our friends, the Manly family, as God has just delivered. He answered our prayer and we prayed for Megan. We just see how God does things that are just amazing. And so has your faith been strengthened by having waited on God and seen his delivery? And if so, then give praise, give testimony through your praise. And when we talk about praise, look up the definition. To, it's to express approval of, to express admiration for, to applaud, to pay tribute to, to speak highly of, to celebrate. That's what worship is all about, is when we get together and we think of who God is, we think about what he's done, we reflect on his goodness, we reflect on how he has done things in our midst that are just amazing, and we celebrate, we praise. And it really should be reflected in how we praise. David was a, a bit of a dancer. I'm not saying that you got to get up and do a jive. I'm just saying, David, man, he didn't care. when he, I mean, he saw God's deliverance, and he was like, 
yes, God. And he would get out and dance around and sing praises and, and look like an idiot. He even got called down for, for being a disgrace. And he's like, look, I'm going to praise even louder. David got it. He understood that. And he responded in praise. Verse 8, David calls himself to praise God for his goodness. In verse 8, wake up, my soul. Wake up, heart and liar. I will wake up the dawn. David was a musician. And he's like, hey, just calling out to himself, reminding himself, look, I need to worship God for what he has done. Wake up, oh my soul. Stop being so lackadaisical in my worship, but get up and praise him. Sometimes we need to rehearse to ourselves how much God has done and remind ourselves that he is worth it, worthy of worship with everything that we have. In verse 9, he says, I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nation. So David isn't just singing praises to God in his car, his chariot, whatever. He's singing out loud to the peoples, to the nation. He's going to declare God's goodness and faithfulness publicly. His life will be a testimony to God's faithfulness and his love and his grace that has come down from heaven Verse 10, he says, for your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the cloud. And this declares the extent of God's love and the faithfulness with it, which is without end. And this is hard, I think, for us to comprehend. We think about this. Your faithful love is as high as the heaven. It reaches to the clouds that he would love us that much. And I think if we could, if we can comprehend that, then it will truly make us unstoppable because of our confidence in God. And when we think about Jesus, when we think about God having come down, we realize his mercy does come from the heavens. That Christ has come down and shown us mercy. We have hope because of what uh, was told us when the truth uh, ascended, the truth, capital T, ascended into the clouds in Acts chapter 1 verse 9 after he said this he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him being Jesus took him out of their sight while he was going they were gazing into heaven and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them they said men of Galilee why do you stand looking up into heaven this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven our hope is in the fact that Christ who ascended into heaven is coming again. That's our hope. That's what gives us confidence. In verse 11, verse 11, it is the refrain again. This is what should happen to us as we reflect on these things, as we look to what God has done. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So you've got the refrain from, from verse 5 is replete, repeated now of the declaration of praise for all of what we've read in verses 6 through 10, that God may your glory be seen worldwide. And this is what we were talking about earlier, about let your, let your good work shine before men so that they can see them and glorify your Father who's in heaven, so that we can live out our lives in such a way that God's glory goes worldwide because of what he's done in us and what we testify both through our praise and through our words. And this should be our declaration. This should be our prayer. Lord God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth and do it through us. Man, if you get this, then what's preventing us from being like David? That we would live out this glorious God who is doing work, has done a work, and continues to do a work, who seals our, our future as he also carries out our present, as he is the, the sovereign Lord of all. Let's determine that like David, we are going to say, Lord, wake up my soul. You have been good to me. You have been so very good to me. And I'm going to live my life as a testimony of your love. And I'm going to glorify you in all that I do and all I say. Let's determine to do this together as the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for 
the testimony that David has given us, Lord, through Psalm 57, God, as he recorded events that were so important, not just what we see recorded in, in 1 Samuel, where we get the events that happened, Lord, but we get David reflecting on this, like we get commentary, uh, David's own journal here of what he was going through and, and what happened and the results in his soul. So thank you for the narrative that we have. Thank you for telling us what happened and then also, Lord, telling us what happened behind the scenes, behind the curtain. And may we reflect that, Lord, that you carry out amazing things in our lives, Lord, and then we, get to, we let other people around us see behind the curtain and see what happened in us and see what good things you have done and to see what a good God you are. May you be honored in this church, Lord. May we be bold and fearless. May our courage be a shining light on Jesus Christ, who is our strength, our power, our hope, our future. And may all this happen for his glory. I pray for those, God, who don't know him. Maybe they've heard of him. Maybe they have a religious understanding of Jesus, but not a personal knowledge of him, not a friendship not a discipleship with Jesus. I pray that would change today, Father, as you minister to hearts, call them to to salvation, grant them repentance, save their souls for your glory. Amen.